So we pray. Almighty and everlasting God, we humbly come now into thy presence and we give thanks for all those who through the years thou hast used to strengthen, to comfort, to guide and to help us. And we thank thee for thy servant who is here with us now and ask that thou wilt guide him and direct him as he gives this memorial lecture for Christ's sake. Amen. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, I'm sure, needs mo no introduction from me, and yet, of course, he most richly deserves one, and so he'll get one, brief though it will be. <clears throat> I suppose that most of us, from time to time, uh, take a service. Well, I reckon that if we preached once a Sunday for a year to the average kind of congregation, which I should think are from time to time before us, we might, in a year, have spoken to as many people as he spoke to maybe one Sunday evening in his church, or on two evenings on his Friday, I think it was, Friday Bible studies. And so, sir, we do feel it's a great privilege for us to have you with us tonight. We welcome you, and I'd ask you on behalf of the Christian Medical Fellowship to deliver the Rendell Short Memorial Lecture 1974. Dr. Martin Lloyd Jones. Thank you, sir, for those kind words. Uh, I feel it's a very great privilege, indeed a great honor, to be asked to give this lecture, and that for a number of reasons. Uh, I had the pleasure of knowing Professor Rendell Short, and indeed knowing him quite well. Uh, that's one of the advantages of getting older, that you remember men who were but names to many of the modern generation. And he was, on all counts, a most interesting person. But the thing for which we honor him most of all, and his memory, is, I think most people would agree, uh, the fact that he was the man who laid hands on Douglas Johnson, and thereby really, in a sense, brought the IVF, as most of us have known it, into being. Uh, I use the term, the biblical term, laying hands on, for that is what he more or less did. Those of you who are historians or theolo theologians would understand it if I said that he was uh, to Douglas Johnson what uh, William Farrell was to John Calvin. I'm not suggesting any parallel, uh, except in a very general sense. But he certainly did that. So in many ways, indirectly, uh, he is also responsible for this Christian medical fellowship. He was one of those men who was known as a Christian doctor. By now, this is a fairly common term. But 30, 40, and 50 years ago, it was an uncommon term. And there were two men, Rendell Short in this country, and Dr. Howard Kelly in America. And they were known in religious circles as Christian doctors. And that tells us a great deal about Rendell Short. He was uh, a famous surgeon and well known for his writings. But preeminently, he stood out as a Christian doctor. So it's very right that there should be this lectureship with its annual lecture uh, to commemorate him and the great work that he did. I couldn't help feeling, as I was preparing this lecture, uh, whether he would actually be interested in what I'm going to talk about. Uh, he was a man who was interested in the relationship between uh, the Christian faith and science and uh, the rest of life uh, in an objective way. Uh, most of his works, as you know, were, were on the apologetic side. He took a very objective view. That, I believe, was not only 
due to the fact that he was a surgeon, but still more, I think, to the religious denomination, or absence of denomination, to which he happened to belong. <laughs> and uh, they're characterized, I think, by this objectivity, uh, rather than by the subjective element, which is more characteristic of the various branches of Methodism and uh, such uh, religious denominations. So I, I don't know that he'd be very interested in what I'm going to attempt to do tonight. However, I've chosen this title of Body, Mind, and Spirit. Let me make it clear that this is not to be a theological lecture on the nature of man. The vexed question of whether it's bipartite or tripartite. That's not what I'm proposing to do. But I'm rather going to consider with you some of the perplexing problems, extremely difficult problems, that confront both medical men and ministers of religion. And there are problems that arise because we are, after all, body, mind, and spirit. And the complex interrelationship between these different parts and aspects of our being. In other words, I'm going to consider with you the case of patients who come either to the doctor or to the minister because they're in need of help. They're in trouble. They're unhappy. And they're unhappy for quite a variety of possible reasons. They may be depressed. They may be anxious. They may be worried about something. They may feel that they can't cope. They may be obsessed by certain fears. They may be troubled about the question of forgiveness. They may be troubled by a lack of assurance. Sometimes they come because they're unable to do their work. And in extreme cases, they come because of suicidal tendencies. The spectrum of possible symptoms, particular symptoms, is a very wide one indeed. Now, that's the kind of case that I want to consider with you. And, of course, we are seeing an increasing number of such cases at the present time. And that, I believe, is due to uh, a number of factors. It's partly due to the character of modern life, the pace of life, the hectic character of life, uh, the lack of help in the home, in the case of the married woman and the mother, and all the so-called rat race and the problems and the stresses and the strains of life and living. And my particular reason for calling attention to it is that uh, I personally have certainly had to spend a great deal of my time in uh, handling and trying to help such cases. And I've been so often asked to talk about this because it is indeed, I think, the case that there is no textbook that I'm aware of at any rate that really does deal with this. It's the realm or the field in which the physical and the psychological and the spiritual and the psychic tend to meet. Very well, let me make it clear that I'm going to confine my attention solely to Christians who are in trouble in this respect. It would be impossible to deal with it if we took in non-Christians as well. Well, now, let me start by making a number of general remarks. And the first is that I believe we need to pay much more attention to this whole group of cases than we have tended to do. And it needs uh, more consideration. There are some books that are available. The books of Tournier uh, had a wide circulation, big book, enormous book by Frank Lake and so on, but still I feel that there is nothing that is really satisfactory in this realm. And I've been stimulated to attempt to deal with it, not only because of my own personal experience, as I say, in handling such cases, but still more, perhaps, because of the constant requests I have had over the years and I'm still having from ministers of religion and some doctors for help in this respect. Now, medical men, I think, are going to become increasingly important in this realm as the years pass, and that is very largely because of the regrettable decline of the church and of the Christian faith in general. Uh, 
people are driven uh, to seek help from the doctors. Not so many ministers are available and so on. Uh, and yet there's a very curious element in this which disturbs me considerably. And that is that though in medicine there is a great deal of talk at the present time about psychosomatic and the personal element and the whole person, a great deal of lip service is paid to that. But at the same time, uh, my observation is that uh, the practice of medicine is becoming increasingly impersonal. Uh, I'm hearing this from the patients in particular, uh, the increasing difficulty of getting a house visit, the reluctance of doctors to visit patients in their homes. Now, there are many causes of this. We needn't go into that. I would attribute this very largely to two factors. The first is the antibiotics, and the second is the National Health Service. You see, in the old days before the antibiotics, when a man was taken suddenly ill, and discovered he was running a high temperature, and so on. Well, uh, the doctor had to visit him and examine him, and he, he may be with congestion of his lungs or starting pneumonia or something, and, uh, well, it was a, a very terrible condition and a very serious one. And the doctor had to pay a daily visit, perhaps twice a day and so on. And thus he was in and out of the home constantly and got to know not only the patient but the relatives. And there was this intimate contact. But what happens now, I'm given to understand, and indeed I can confirm it from personal experience, is that if a man suddenly starts running a temperature, he telephones the doctor and he's told to send somebody around to get the tablets. And uh, so he's treated by tablet and may not even see the doctor at all. I'm exaggerating it in order to call attention to it. But the result of this is that the contact between the doctor and the patient is not what it is used to be. And yet I'm suggesting, it is my whole thesis, that never was there a greater need of this intimate personal contact and knowledge than there is at the present time, owing to these new circumstances, the stress and the strain of life to which I've already referred. Now, again under this general heading of general remarks, uh, I would comment on just a few faulty tendencies that I seem to have observed in this field over the years. Uh, some of the, I'll start with the medical men, uh, and especially perhaps the surgeons. They tend to dismiss these people entirely as neurotics. It's the surgical attitude towards them. Uh, they uh, feel that all these people need is a little breezy talk, or what they may call a pep talk. Uh, they give a general reassurance, slap the patient on the back, and tell them to go and take some exercise. This uh, sort of uh, muscular Christianity, as it was once called. Well, the, that, that is, I'm going to show you that this is a totally inadequate approach. Or the doctor, more generally, may just content himself with prescribing some tablets or medicine of some sort and uh, trying to calm the patient, and then he reconciles himself to the fact that he'll have to put up with periodic visits from this patient and just repeat the medicine, repeat the medicine, repeat the dose, and he just uh, resigns himself to his fate and really never meets the situation as it needs to be met. I'm going to try to show that these conditions, while from a strictly medical standpoint they may not appear to be very serious, are in daily life and living very serious indeed and mean a great deal to the unfortunate sufferers. With regard to ministers of religion, their danger, I would say on the whole, is to get too involved. That's very rarely the danger of the medical man. He has learned to be more detached. He has to be. He develops a kind of protective mechanism. But the minister doesn't know about this. And he gets too involved, too emotionally involved. And I've known many instances of ministers of religion who really had a breakdown themselves simply because they didn't know how to handle some of their parishioners or church members who came to them suffering from one or other of these conditions. Another danger with the minister is to regard everything as spiritual and to treat it on 
purely spiritual lines. I've often told the story of returning to Westminster Chapel one Sunday afternoon about five o'clock. Uh, two men, two excellent men, came in to me and looking pale and drawn and exhausted. And I commented immediately and asked them what was the matter. Well, they said, that's why we've come to see you. And I said, well, what's been happening? And they told me how they'd been talking for three hours uh, to a man uh, who was uh, an obvious manic depressive and who'd had repeated treatments in various institutions. They'd been dealing with him in a purely spiritual manner. They hadn't made the slightest difference to him, but they'd succeeded in exhausting themselves. And it's because of this failure to draw some of these distinctions and the danger of getting too involved themselves. Uh, another danger with ministers in this realm I have found is this, that uh, the patients feel that they can't trust the minister in this way, that they're afraid that uh, they will be used as illustrations. Let me illustrate this in one case. I once uh, got to know a minister from America happened to come to this country and to London and uh, in a most amazing way uh, something happened to him in a, in a Sunday morning service. The man had come from America because he was what they called on the verge of a breakdown and his deacons and church had insisted upon his taking a six months rest and holiday, paid all his expenses and so on. Uh, that man his problem was completely solved through just listening to the sermon. And it was as a result of that that I got to know him. And I remember saying to him when he told me his whole story, I said, well, surely you could have consulted one of your brethren in America, uh, certain prominent ministers whom I named and so on. I said, did you go and talk to them? Oh, no, he said. I said, why not? Well, he said, I was afraid to. I said, why were you afraid to? He said, I would have been used as an illustration in a sermon. They wouldn't have mentioned my name, but they would have given so many details that most people would have been able to work it out, and they would have soon have discovered that I was the man to whom the reference was made. This uh, love of illustrations and stories, you see, made the poor men afraid to go to people who really were in a position uh, to help him. However, those are general dangers. But there's one other aspect of this matter that, to which I must make reference. <coughs> which uh, amazed me some uh, 35 to 40 years ago. Evangelical Christians had uh, been uh, much opposed to uh, psychology until that time. There was a, a notorious, a famous perhaps I ought to say, a minister of religion who was well known as a psychologist and who wrote books on these matters. And he was on the whole frowned upon by evangelicals and they didn't quite approve of this. But there was a dramatic change in the attitude of evangelical people roughly, as I say, some, well, 35 years or so ago. And suddenly, a great vogue of psychology and of interest in psychology came into evangelical circles. And uh, they were all now sending people to see a psychologist. I've often told the story of a poor fellow who came into me on a Sunday night, and uh, he was in great trouble. He'd been told to go to a college to be trained to be an evangelist, and he couldn't follow the lectures and so on. And he'd gone to the principal to say that he couldn't do this. And the, the principal immediately said to him, you must see a psychologist. And the men had only come to me to ask for the name of a Christian psychologist. Now, this had become the vogue. And some of you perhaps are old enough to remember a particular psychologist practicing who had a great vogue and even wrote articles to a certain religious weekly paper and who worked very hard indeed seeing almost exclusively evangelical Christians and found it a most lucrative practice. <laughs> he was, a, he was a, a Freudian. And it was amazing to me that suddenly evangelicals were all sending people to this particular man. This was something quite new. And then one heard of missionary societies even, sending missionary candidates to be interviewed by a psychologist or a psychotherapist. 
in order to find whether they really were fit and proper people to send to the mission field. This, of course, had been happening in business and in other realms, but what was truly astonishing was that it, it began to invade evangelical circles. It was one of these curious phases uh, which uh, appear amongst us as evangelicals from time to time, our proneness to fads and fancies and fashions. Well, these are just some general points. My last general remark is this, that uh, lay Christians seem to me to do untold harm to this kind of sufferer. Uh, almost invariably, I have to spend time in undoing what some overzealous lay person, I'm sorry to say, generally female, uh, has done uh, in talking to these poor people and doing it in a glib manner, uttering cliches, and they invariably do much more harm than good. Very well. Now let's approach our problem in this way. This is, I'm going to try to describe to you as best I can uh, my own practice, what I've been doing over the years. There I would be standing in my vestry and somebody would come in and I was presented with a problem. This person's in trouble. One of the reasons which I've already enumerated has brought them to me. What, come, now, what am I to do for them? Well, the first thing I had to do was to decide which group they belonged to, or which department, if you like, they belonged to. The first task was diagnosis, which involved immediately a differential diagnosis. And this is really my theme in this lecture, the differential diagnosis in the case of these poor people who come with these various problems. Let me say at once, it's something which is extremely difficult. I find differential diagnosis in this realm much more difficult than in clinical medicine. Difficult as that may be at times. But this is extremely difficult. And uh, it is, of course, a vast subject. I, I'm not going to pretend to deal with it in any exhaustive manner. I'm only going to give you some general points and review the subject in a very general manner. The trouble with doing this, of course, is this that it is so much easier to do it in practice than to state in words what one's doing. Now, I'm not suggesting by that that one is able to do this work by some sort of instinct or horse sense. That comes into it, I have no doubt, and experience is very valuable. But it's such a, a complicated process. You have to make evaluations and estimates, and so much depends upon question and answer that it's almost impossible, I find, to state it in words. I've been trying to put all this into words for uh, many years and still find it extremely difficult, if not impossible. And my only hope is that when I've finished, it'll not be a case of confusion worse confounded. Yet this is something which I'm saying is very essential. I've known people who've been treated in a very cruel manner, the people who treated them thus were not aware of being cruel. They didn't want to be cruel, but they were being cruel because of their ignorance. You're dealing with souls, you're dealing with persons, and we're all sensitive. We're all highly strung in a sense, finely balanced, and great harm can be done very well. Here then is the patient or the person who's here for help of what is now called counseling. How do we start? Well, my first question always was this. Is it physical? I want to emphasize this because there are some people to whom it never occurs that the whole thing may be physical because the complaint is in the realm of something nervous. It's assumed at once that there cannot be any physical cause. But I found so often that the entire trouble was due to some physical cause which could be treated. I have, uh, I think, reported a case uh, of a lady I was once asked to see, uh, preaching in a certain town, afternoon and evening. I was asked if I'd see this lady between the two services. And she'd been depressed and so on, a schoolmistress. She'd given up her Sunday school superintendency and was not coming to the services so regularly and become depressed and unhappy and so on. And she'd been having uh, treatment by correspondence from this great Christian uh, 
psychologist, this minister, famous minister who practiced psychology, treating her by correspondence. And, of course, I just took one look at the woman, and she was a glaring case of pernicious anemia. I don't know that you see them now. You treat them much earlier. But uh, we used to be able to spot pernicious anemia by looking at them, the lemon yellow tint and so on, so characteristic. She was an obvious case, and the treatment of the anemia put the woman right. Well, then, we therefore have got to start with this. I remember another instance, and I'm giving you these examples to make my meaning plain and clear. I remember once uh, being asked to see an old man uh, who was in bed, and the trouble was that he was swearing like a trooper. That was the expression. Now, this man was a deacon in a chapel, and a highly respected deacon. But here he was, swearing. And uh, what puzzled everybody was, was where he'd heard the vocabulary. <laughs> uh, however, the, uh, the, the problem to uh, his poor wife and the relatives and, and his minister and his doctor, with whom I saw the man, was the fact that this good old saint was behaving in this manner. And it was an acute spiritual problem to them. Well, it was perfectly clear that this man uh, had arterial sclerosis and probably, especially, uh, the arteries at the base of his brain. And I was able to explain to them that this had a physical cause, that this wasn't a spiritual problem at all, a purely physical problem. And thereby, I was able to give them great comfort. And now, recently, it's been very interesting. You've read about the case of King George III and this uh, porphyrinuria and so on. He used to have periodic bouts of madness, as it was called. But now the view taken by so many is that this can be explained quite simply in this uh, physical manner. Uh, but before this, uh, one was aware of the case of the great Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Spurgeon used to get fits of depression. And in these fits of depression, he would feel sometimes that he was not called to preach. Sometimes he'd even feel that he wasn't fit to preach. Now, what was the matter with Spurgeon? Well, the trouble with Spurgeon was that he suffered from gout. And if you suffer from gout, if you have the gouty diathesis and have it in an articular form as he had, well, you will be depressed. It's a part of the condition. So, you see, you have to start with this possibility. Now, I've got a particularly interesting case to quote you at this point. It, it's a, a case that has recently come to light. It's the case of Charles Darwin. And uh, I'm going to quote to you now out of a statement made by Max Hamilton, who was an experimental psychologist in Cambridge, and he took part in a discussion in a BBC program on Freud, the status of an illusion. And uh, this is what he says. During much of Darwin's long life, he suffered from a mysterious illness characterized by heart palpitations and feelings of lethargy and gloom. His doctors could discern no physical cause, and, as he himself suspected and rather resented, he was widely believed to be a hypochondriac. Darwin's hypochondria was a gift to the post-mortem analysts. He's referring here to Freud and company, and how they spread themselves over it. Darwin, they explained, hated his father. How do they know, you will ask? Well, they say so. And besides, he once wrote that his father was the kindest man he had ever known. And that proves it. <laughs> and then he adds, doesn't it? So he hated his father and felt guilty about it. Also, they say, he felt that his theories had dethroned God, who was a sort of heavenly father which made his life work, Darwin's life work, symbolically equivalent to killing or castrating his father, which he wanted to do anyway. In brackets, Oedipus and all that, and felt guilty about it. So, having a powerful conscience, superego is the word in their jargon, uh, he proceeded to punish himself with psychosomatic illness and misery. I have to spoil this lovely fantasy, says Hamilton, 
by pointing out that none of it is called for, because it now appears that Darwin had contracted Chagas's disease during his stay in Argentina, and the symptoms of Chagas's disease, which is a kind of parasitic infection, are palpitations, <coughs> lethargy, and gloom. I've taken the trouble to turn up Chagas's disease, which I've never heard of before, <laughs> uh, and I find that the symptoms as described in the recent textbooks of medicine uh, do bear this, this characteristic. Well, now, there, you see, is another striking case. A man labeled as being neurotic or suffering from a psychosomatic illness and so on. Whereas the whole explanation is a physical one and a natural one. And I remember very well, uh, back in 1956 in America, I stumbled across a book which had a most arresting title. The title was Body, Mind and Sugar. And it was actually a book by a medical man and a biochemist on hyperinsulinemia. And it seemed to me that they established the case beyond any doubt based on blood sugars, which they took. They gave their patients the, their dose of glucose, and then they took the blood sugars every hour. And the whole thesis of the book was, if you took the blood sugar at the sixth hour after the meal, you would find that it would be very interesting and would give you indications of hyperinsulinemia, the exact opposite of diabetes. And the number of symptoms that that condition can produce, <coughs> mental, mental, nervous symptoms and so on, is really quite astonishing. So it's very important that we should exclude a possible or a conceivable physical cause. Well, that was my first question. The second question I asked was this. If it isn't physical, is it spiritual? Now, I'm in a little bit of trouble about this order. Until comparatively recently, this was the order I adopted. I'm not sure that by now I wouldn't vary it a little. However, let me adhere to what has been my practice through the years. Is this a spiritual problem? What do I mean? Well, is it a problem that can be dealt with purely and solely in spiritual terms? Now, this again takes many forms. The commonest of these problems, I would say, are lack of assurance. That's a very common one. People are troubled about this, assurance. We were hearing so excellently about it last night. Then the others come because of some particular sin. If only they could get rid of this sin, but this is getting them down. Or it may be the memory of a particular sin in the past. Another, uh, another example is, blasphemy or sin against the Holy Ghost. Or it may be serious backsliding or something like that. Now, these spiritual cases can come with presenting symptoms, if I may use such a term, which can be quite alarming. I'll give you one striking illustration and example of this. I remember, it must be getting on for 40 years ago, a little less perhaps, uh, I, I was told one day that there was a man at the door in a state of great agitation with a younger man with him. And I went to the door and there indeed was a man in a state of very great agitation, tall fellow and uh, hair all ruffled and could scarcely contain him. So well, I brought them into my study and began to talk and I found that this man uh, had just uh, discharged himself from a nursing home where he'd been treated for six weeks uh, for religious mania. And he really was desperate, virtually tearing his hair. And uh, when he took hold of me in his desperation, I had a terrible feeling that he could crush me if he wanted to. He was such a powerful man, but he was beside himself. And the story was this. This man had been converted in the Welsh Revival of 1904 and five. And as a result of this, he'd become a very good man and a fine Christian and had done well in business. But after a number of years, he began to be a little bit slack. He began to smoke and drink and so on. In other words, he had become a thoroughgoing backslider. And he'd gone on like this for many years, doing very well indeed. He'd become a wealthy man. But as regards his Christianity, a backslider. Suddenly, and without any warning, and he never knew why, the reality of his position came home to him. And he began to worry about it. 
and it took this form. He said, of course, before, uh, when I was unconverted, I did these things I didn't know any better. And I was forgiven, that's all right, but now I've sinned against the light. I knew the truth, and I knew better. But I've been doing this, there's no forgiveness. And he began to get worried about this. The doctor diagnosed him as religious mania, which is the common diagnosis, and he'd been put into this nursing home, and there he'd been treated in various ways, but was getting worse rather than better. Well now, this is an example of this kind of case. I put him under this spiritual heading because the treatment I gave him was purely spiritual. I needn't have known any medicine at all. I dealt with him purely in terms of the scripture and its teaching, and the man was completely delivered. I've had many, many such cases. I remember a lady who was in quite a, a prominent and responsible position, which involved her having to take prayers every morning. And she'd got into a state where she could no longer do this. She would sweat violently, and in the end she couldn't do it at all. And it was all due to something she'd said about God 22 years before. This woman had had two courses of deep analysis. I think both were by the gentleman to whom I've already made reference. And she'd also had treatment from others. And the way in which he came to me was quite interesting. I, I received a letter asking if I would see her, so I saw her, and she only had one question to ask me, could I recommend a Christian psychologist? That was a very common request that was made of me uh, when I was at Westminster Chapel. And I sent many people to such, but I think I prevented still more from going to them. <laughs> and I used to say at one time that if you ever heard that I'd been shot, you could be quite sure I'd been shot by a psychotherapist. <laughs> However, that's all she wanted. But I began to say, why do you need to see a psychologist? That's the question to put. Why? And she told me her story. And it was quite clear to me that she needed scriptural understanding. She needed to reason properly from the scriptures. And she really was completely delivered. And, and uh, she's still alive and rejoicing in her Christian life. Now, the diagnostic point, this is what I'm trying to come to to help. I felt always that I had a diagnostic point with these people, and it is this. These people always show a readiness to listen and almost to jump at the verses one quotes to them which give them relief. Now, they may argue a lot, and they do but they always give the impression that they want relief and they really do listen and they hold on to verses which really help to give them release and an element of comfort. So you mustn't be put off by their saying yes but. They're really doing that in order to, for you to make your case still stronger. They want you to make your case. That to me was a diagnostic point in the case of those whom I put into this spiritual category. The next category, the third category, is the psychological. I, I use that term, a general term, or if you prefer it, mental illness. Now this is a, a very interesting category, and especially at the present time, because we are now in the midst of one of the latest crazes or fashions in evangelical circles in this department. This concept of mental illness is under great attack at the present time. And this is mainly the result of uh, the writings of a man called Thomas Saz, S-Z-A-S-Z, -S -Z, in America. He's written a number of books. Here are some of his titles. The Myth of Mental Illness, Ideology and Insanity, The Manufacture of Madness. What's his thesis? His thesis is this that this regarding of people as mentally ill and treating them accordingly is but the latest manifestation of something that has been taking place throughout the centuries. In the Middle Ages he said it was this. It was punishment of heterodoxy by the church. If a man became a heretic, he was ostracized, he was punished in various ways. The Inquisition. That was the form it took then. But then he said that gradually went out and it was replaced by witch hunt hunting. 
And of course there was a tremendous work of witch hunting in the Christian church. And it continued until the end of the 17th century in this country and in America. And then that went. What do they do now? What they do now, he said, is to diagnose people as being mentally ill and put them into various institutions. His whole argument, this is his thesis in his books, he repeats it in all his books, that uh, this is precisely what is happening. And this is something which we have to resist. Now, this man says in his writings, uh, I find uh, not only interesting but uh, most entertaining. He's a brilliant writer and undoubtedly a very able man. And if you want some enjoyable reading, you try some of these books of this man. I know that they're available in the Royal Society of Medicine, but I, I believe they can, I know some of them are actually printed in this country by now. And of course there's a great deal of truth in what he says. He is a violent anti-Freudian. He's attacking this which has become a cult. A cult, as I say, which came into evangelical circles, sent him to a psychologist. Everybody labeled at once. Everything psychological. Now he makes a tremendous attack upon this. He deals in some of his books with the financial aspect of this, and it needs to be dealt with. But what concerns him still more is the element of moral judgment that is involved. What he means is this, that sometimes a man can be labeled in a moral sense by his wife and family and the doctor, and the poor man is completely helpless. He is simply put into, treat into treatment in some shape or form, they, they assess him, they pass judgments upon him, and he points out that if this continues, that there will be a real danger to individual liberty. Now, you've read probably in the press, if not elsewhere, of how all this is happening in Russia at the present time, and there it's in a blatant form. But there is no doubt whatsoever but that in America it's entered a lot into industry and in men either not being given a post or being sacked from the post and so on. And in many other respects, people who are in any way difficult are immediately labeled. A judgment is passed and they are condemned in spite of their own wishes. And he points out how, and quite rightly, he's right in pointing out that these psychiatrists take it upon themselves to pass opinions upon anybody. Uh, I've quoted you the statement already how uh, they make these post-mortem diagnoses of men who've lived in the past. Uh, the case of Darwin and others. Everybody can be explained. And they can tell you all about Hamlet and so on. These post-mortem diagnoses. But th they do the same kind of thing with people who are still alive. And he quotes in one of his books uh, how the character of a man who was setting up uh, to be president of the United States was assessed in this way and it was published in the papers. And there were people who were ready to believe it, believing, of course, that these men have a complete understanding of human nature and of the various aspects and characteristics of that nature. So he stresses this tremendous danger, and he exposes it all. And he has some most interesting and amusing things to say. Uh, he quotes, you see, from the past, and what he's out to prove is this, that you read of what they did with people like this in the past, and you're horrified. He says they're doing exactly the same now in a more polite way. And amongst the other things which he quotes was this one. He points out in his book, The Manufacture of Madness, this, here I quote, as, recent, as recently as 1860, it was not necessary to be mentally ill to be incarcerated in an American mental institution. It was enough to be a married woman. When the celebrated Mrs. Packard was hospitalized in the Jacksonville State Insane Asylum for disagreeing with her minister husband, the commitment laws of the state of Illinois proclaimed that married women may be entered or detained in the hospital at the request of the husband or the woman or the of the woman or the guardian without the evidence of insanity required in other cases here was a woman who was thrown into an asylum for venturing you see to disagree with her minister husband now i'd be interested to know your reaction to that kind of statement i'm sure that most of you would 
bemoan the fact that human beings were, have ever been guilty of such conduct. But I think I know one or two present who are muttering to themselves, those were the days. <laughs> However... This recording of the Rendell Short Lecture given by Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones will be found on the next CD in this series. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any